Let's have a look. Say some Cha cha cha. This is <laughs> a normal speaking level, I reckon. Yeah, there we go. We're on. Exciting. Yeah, how you doing? I'm really good for doing this. It's breaking up the monotony. I've been looking forward to it all week. So, so what day are you on now? Um, the day you arrive is day zero. That was last Monday. It's Sunday today, so I'm on day six. Right, and you got to do what two Tuesday, weeks? Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, um, fourteen days. So I'll get out on March the eighth. In on February the twenty second. Out on March the eighth. Right. So, um, how's it been? <laughs> do you know what I've? I I was thinking it was. I was actually really looking forward to it. I've been so hectic for seven weeks on Ski Sunday, and I was already in the rhythm of a single person bubble because we were like the BBC contract for Ski Sunday said you can't. We're only three people, so they said if you're a bubble of three people and one of you gets it, you you all go down and the show's gone. So you have to live in single person bubbles. So I've been doing this. I'm into my eighth week of like solo isolation. And that, that's right. not fair. We were, when we were outdoors, two meters apart, we were, we were chatting. We were socializing during the day. But this is a step up. I said to you before, it's like an open prison in Telford. There's, I'm in Hamilton, an hour and a half south of Auckland. And we've got a car park. And because I've buckled my knee, I'm on crutches. So I get 45 minutes to crutch around a car park once a day, which is... How's your mental... How's your sanity? Because one thing that's really struck me, because obviously we've been chatting quite a lot over the last few weeks, since you did your knee, really. And, I mean, your mental strength is is always very impressive to me. And, like, you just don't seem that phased. Like, we'll get to the knee in a minute. But like by by the knee firstly, and also by this like you know eight weeks quarantine. Like over here, everybody's like properly kicking off about the even the even the the idea of like two week quarantine after you do a foreign trip or whatever. And you don't seem you just seem to take it all in your stride. Like is that how it is? It's if we could get into a deep conversation about sort of journeys into understanding yourself quite quickly i'm i'm sure like i've realized whether it was moving out of verbier which was my best life i think back to new zealand or whether it's breaking your knee or whether it's going into quarantine for two weeks i will just whatever's in front of me i'll get on with that's kind of my nature i i you can grumble and complain about stuff but if it's happening there's nothing you can do about it like these are the rules and for me in the short term, the idea of living in two weeks of isolation to then live in a COVID free society is a tiny price to pay. So I don't care about this. Like that's just the price of freedom afterwards. But if I compared that to the UK, I had quite I realise now when I came over to Europe after nine months in New Zealand with almost complete freedom to do whatever we wanted domestically as long as you didn't want to leave it was very easy to get on a high horse and talk about the virtues of lockdowns and elimination strategies but seeing Europe seeing how long people have been under these restrictions I just shut my mouth instantly I was like this this is completely different and there's like it's not fair to preach like there's so many factors that allow New Zealand uh to successfully eradicate or or really work on just cutting down covid because you've got almost no public transport you've got so very little communal living in apartment blocks you've got really easy borders to control there's so many factors that make eradication and low levels a possibility yeah, well, we were saying as well on the message, weren't we? Like, no one knows. Like, you can't, you can't. Like, I find, I find, a lot of it is just like people wanting to have an opinion in the modern way about it. But no one knows. No one knows what's the right 
correct approach, really, in this. I mean, the the great the great thing about this whole situation in in well, not the great thing because that's a weird way of putting it, but one of the interesting <laughs> things about this whole situation is that uh, what's going on is there's like a worldwide controlled experiment on what's the best way of dealing with a pandemic in the modern era, isn't there? Because you've got New Zealand have approached it that way. You know, obviously there's always Taiwan and Korea get cited, and then you've got like the complete libertarian approaches in brazil and the states and you've got what's going on in europe really which is of a piece i think you know i think like the way that the uk have handled it and france and germany are all pretty similar really you know with little discrepancies no one really can say until the end of it like what the best approach was so i just think even even like having you don't need to have an opinion on it like you say i think you can just like help people just need help getting through it don't they at this point and i I find this relentless ramming your viewpoint down people's throats about every aspect of it like not not like depressing just a bit pointless it's just like you you can't we can't possibly know what what, how it's going to pan out and that's like i've had this we've all had this conversation over and over and over again on different social media platforms with mates. And I, I thankfully hit on that quite early on. I think I was about four months into it, having some great conversations. I've, I've got to admit, but they were repetitive. You how you're kind of having the same arguments using different words with different people. But I, yeah, I got to that point with um, Vernon Depp, the photographer, and we were having a really good discussion about it. And we just said it's, We'll, we'll agree to disagree on our viewpoints of it, but we both agreed that it'll be 10 years, it'll be a decade, maybe two decades before anyone knows what the right course of action was and where we were. Because exactly as you say, no one knows. We, we haven't got a clue. We're fumbling around in the dark with the facts that are uncovered. It's literally like an archaeological dig of a Tyrannosaurus Rex and we've got a toenail. Yeah, and I think the, one of the things you said on a text to me really stayed with me you i think we were talking about some friends of ours that are particularly anti-vax or whatever oh which i fundamentally disagree with like that's by the by really but um and you said like it was always in them the situations just brought it out and that is very true like i think and i think that's the thing that struck me isn't it if you whatever personality trait that you had or like whatever hobby horse that you had you know, whatever whatever you had to get off your chest, this is certainly proven to be the perfect <laughs> forum in a lot of ways, hasn't it? I mean, that's why I actually can't go on Facebook. Like, I'm not on there because I just can't actually look at it. I can't look at people arguing the toss about vaccines and lockdowns and getting really angry with each other. And because essentially, it's not really about that, is it? It's just people's personalities coming to the fore and and being hyper magnified in a lot of ways, isn't it? I saw a brilliant cartoon the other day, uh, and it's a guy sat in front of his um, computer. And he says, "Honey, wait a second! I found something here on the internet that the scientists and experts have missed." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, is that you? Is that you beeping? Yeah, hold on. Sorry. That's all right. Is that your COVID? Yeah, alarm? I was gonna, I was gonna break it up and uh, explain that that's the icing and compression machine inflating itself every half an hour, and if my leg's not in it, then it starts going berserk. Ah, right. Okay. Well, perfect segue. Almost. <laughs> we can keep it in now because it's <laughs> led us so nicely to. I put some questions on Insta, and I, also I think the COVID chat. I think, I think we can come back to certain elements of that, but um. I think mean, everyone's pretty jaded on the COVID chat, so let's, yeah. let's not go too, let's not go too the fact deep that we're, into it. The fact that we're discussing that we're done with it probably means that we shouldn't be talking about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I did put some questions on Instagram, uh, which I will uh, refer to at some, like later on, I think, which is not something I normally do, but I will I will basically um, I had a great one. Like, ask a few questions. But one of that, like a lot of them were, a lot of them were about the knee. So come on, hit us. Kill us with the knee. What happened? Um, We filmed, so just done seven weeks in Larks. Got Ski Sunday off the ground. Took some real convincing with the BBC Sport top brass. Because there were three plans in the mix. 
there was do ski Sunday in the mountains, travel round, but the COVID testing bill estimate came in and that one was out. Then it right. was uh, do it from snow domes and dry slopes in the UK or Scotland, travel round. Um, and then the UK went into severe lockdown and that was off the table. Then there was uh, do it from a studio in Media City, Salford in Manchester. So right. you were uh, like, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I suggested fairly quickly, I said, can we not just go to a resort that's got really good COVID protocols and be on snow? Like that's, there's a lot of superfluous elements to this show, myself included, but snow's not one of them. So yeah, we managed to get it off the ground. Larks were incredible because we went round and had a look at all of the resorts and it was amazing how disparate the resort with everything else like government responses like people's responses resorts have reacted completely differently to this and larks just had a really clear blanket they were like everyone wears masks all season we've got reduced capacity in all of the lifts and we've got a certain we've got a cap on lift tickets sold so you're like okay that sounds like a bit of us and we set it up and we managed to get it off the ground so i was in awe i thought we were going to be rained with hate for showing the British public something that they couldn't do, but overwhelmingly right. was that was that was that a real concern then? Were you all a bit like what in in the in the hateful model modern phrase, what are the optics going to be on this kind of thing? <laughs> I don't think I've ever been part of a conversation where optics were an issue. That's uh, yeah, I was. How, how does it look? How's it going to look? How's it going to play? Exactly, and I <laughs> I was really scared. I was really really scared of that because you don't have a defence either. So I started kind of drip feeding the idea into money saving snow tips and a couple of uh, posts on stuff to try and find out. And it was it was really positive. There was that need. People wanted something to hold on to and escape something that showed them a, a, a modicum of uh, a shred of normality. And that was so we thought, OK, this is on. So, so this was all planned in the autumn, like the, the, all this this kind of approach, or was it later than that? Because it changed so much. Literally uh, early December. So right. I was panicking in New Zealand. Your big issue, if you're thinking about leaving, is getting back in because you're not allowed to leave until you've got your spot in managed isolation quarantine, where I am now, without that booked. And that was getting booked up. So I was able to, I, they said, oh yeah, you can leave. You can go home on the 17th of February. And I said, no, the earliest I can get in is the 22nd. Chris Kirkham, who booked 20 minutes after me, couldn't come home till the 23rd. So right. it's really, it's worrying. If you want to leave, it's, but there's thousands of people trying to get in with these limited spots and people are just booking two or three. So they've got options to come home. Right. Okay. Uh, it's, so it's all it, it was all pretty. So, but there was an appetite to do it because at one point, I guess you must have been thinking, well, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And Graham Bell, my co-presenter, fully bet on black on that front. He was like, "I'm going on Dancing on Ice. This isn't going to happen." How'd that work out for him? <laughs> not ideal. Sorry, Graham. He doesn't <laughs> listen to this anyway. We're safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he managed to stab his dancing partner with his skate right really nasty fall and i think that pretty much did for him but yeah and then ski sunday ran so yeah that that was not a bet that play, paid off for him but yeah it did pay off for us we got the series underway and we first week just incredible getting out on snow being able to film freezing cold coldest i've ever been filming it was like minus 20 on some days and when right. you, I don't know if you've ever done it, but if you try and present and talk, so you're going to spend 15, 20 minutes on one link, just getting all the different angles, making sure you've got it all right. And your mouth, your cheeks start to slow down. They start to freeze after a while. So you can't actually, your mouth won't keep up with your brain. It's a really odd sensation. And you have to kind of go inside. But in a pandemic, all of the lift infrastructure is closed. None of the resorts are open. So you literally have to just go and try and find some shelter and then rub your cheeks. It's hard work. Right. <laughs> yeah. But got, got, two, got two shows done. And at the, the end of the second show, it just started dumping. As only larks can in, 
it's it's kind of just on the edge of that what I would call Ken, continental Alps. The maritime, the Alp Maritime, has finished in kind of Western Switzerland, and the mountains have got a little bit flatter. They're not quite as spiky as they are around Zermatt, but the temperatures get more consistently cold around there. So lower altitudes and it's a little bit more humid and you just get so much snow. And it it dumped. It really dumped. Like we got 30 centimetres, then 40 centimetres, then 20 centimetres, and then we had this 50, 60 centimetre day. And we got the last of Ski Sunday done. I wax lyrical about uh, doing yoga and staying bendy and strong. And then the next day we went out to go and rip round in this waist deep powder. And um, within an hour, I'd found a submerged tree stump. Horiz- flying through the air horizontal, I'd lost my balance because the snow was so deep on a drop. Flying through the air horizontal and got a, this sturdy tree stump in the on the outside of my knee. And I knew straight away, kind of had that black flash, white flash of pain where you think, oh God, that was something big. But then it was gone and it was just... I sort of started taking stock and I tried to straighten my leg and it was locked. My front leg that had hit the tree stump, left leg, had locked at 90 degrees and I tried to straighten it and it just wasn't straightening. I was like, I've, I've had, done a fair few things with my knees. So I thought, oh, this is new. Tried to stay calm and reached down, sort of felt my knee and could feel my kneecap round the side of my knee and thought, oh, no. This is this is not good. <laughs> when you say like round the side, so like as in as in so if this is your knee, like and there's where your kneecap should be, like on round here. Yeah, ninety degrees. It's gone round ninety degrees. It's <coughs> on the outside of my knee. So um, as it turns out, what I'd done because I'd hit the knee on the outside, it had then bent like a clock. If you imagine looking down on a clock. And it's at six o'clock. So um, big hands at 12, little hands at six. And then you're taking the impact from three o'clock. And it bends back to about kind of five past five then. So it snapped the medial ligament, the one on the inside. It snapped the ACL. It fractured the tibia where it impacted. And it tore the meniscus. And because it bent like that, the kneecap was able to slide into that space. It lost the tension and pulled the kneecap down. And... As horrific as it sounds, I've read up a little bit about kneecap dislocation after having done it. And it's supposed to be one of the most awful things you can do. But I think because I'd snapped everything, the tension in the joint was released. So I was able to stay relatively. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I was able to stay relatively calm. So I sat there and was like, oh no. I was like, Dougie! I was with Dougie and Shemi Alcott and Chris Kirkham, a.k.a. Zoid, the cameraman. So I yelled out, I was like, Dougie! Zoid! And there was just nothing. And I was like, oh no. And then Dougie appeared off the same drop and landed about a foot away from my head in the wow. snow. And I just, I shouted, help! And I haven't done it for a while, actually. I'm trying to think knocked myself out a couple of times and come round and done some groggy helps. But I did three or four big helps. So I thought, I can't move. I can't go anywhere. And I'm a fair way off piste. And no one's going to find me. As it turned out, only when they got back to me, only my goggles were sticking out of the snow. But Dougie ran back right. up. Then Zoid came in. Shemi went straight down to get help. And I sort of explained to Dougie, I said, I've dislocated my kneecap. And he said after, it's just like, bullshit. There's no way you've dislocated your kneecap. Like, you'd be screaming. I was like, no, I definitely have. Can you get on Google and look at how to relocate it? Because it's not very comfortable. And we're a fair way off anyone coming and can relocate this. So um, oh, man. He, he got on Google and it, was, it said, elevate the leg. And then one person needs to straighten it. And then the other person needs to pull the kneecap round as they do that. So... <laughs> Chris oh, Kirkham, God. the cameraman, I was like, right, Chris, you get on the leg and straighten it. And he, it's when you're in the center of that, it's, I imagine it's a bit like having a baby. When you're dealing with it, you're just getting on with it. But I, as a husband, watching someone go through that, I think is m- almost more traumatizing because you feel so helpless. 
certainly that's the way I've felt with Sean over the years. And Chris Kirkham, I, I saw that look that I must have had on my face. I could see him just white and so <laughs> distressed at having to do this. Like am- amateur hour relocating kneecaps. I've got to be honest, if I'd have been there and you'd have said to me, I mean, even when you're telling me, and even when you've, t- I mean, I've heard this story before um, when you told me the first time, but, it, I, you know, I was like, yeah, right. That's, there's only you that would probably say that, really. But I, I think I'd be the same. I'd be like, what the fuck, really? You you know, you actually want to do that now? I but, wasn't, you know, I wasn't sound, having a great time. Like, yeah, it sounds like, obviously, proper shock, though, doesn't it, as well? You know, because your body, your, body, your, your body must have gone into, like, proper shock if you've done that. I imagine, yeah. But I, I, I had a fairly standard conversation with both of the boys. I don't feel like... I've seen people in shock after car accidents and avalanches when they just, they're kind of looking for pound coins or they're just walking in circles. But, your body, was, but your body, like, physically must be... Must yeah. Be dealing, like, dealing with it. Like, you know, there must be a lot of adrenaline going around, a lot of, like, oh, yeah. kind of natural, natural sort of, like... Painkillers. Fucking hell, lads. <laughs> <laughs> and down the hatches. <laughs> Send it all down to that knee. This dickhead's going to try and relocate it. <laughs> and he, we did it. We It took two goes. The first go, like it kind of locked and I couldn't get it over. Second go, me and Dougie oh, both God. had our hands under the kneecap and we got it back in. And relief was instant. I remember seeing Elliot Neve dislocate his shoulder. And thinking at the time that I might have seen his cum face. <laughs> it was... <laughs> Jesus. The relief. No, is un... it's, you watch there's, someone. There's a mental like... image. <laughs> <laughs> there's, the, there's the instant not safe for work warning on this one. <laughs> Sorry. But that's, no, that's what it was. Funny. Yeah, it was definitely sex face when it went back in. I was like, oh, oh, yeah, okay. That's How funny. long did all this take, like, from from when you did it? I don't know, 10 minutes? That was right. probably five, 10 minutes. It was pretty quick. And then there was a big discussion about getting patrollers in. It took a good half an hour to get the patrollers in, and your body temperature is dropping really fast by that stage because all of those lovely natural chemicals are seeping out and you're kind of going, just drifting back to normality. But these... Five patrollers turned up and it was like good, decent gradient of piece run on a, like the whole run, it's probably average pitch for about 25 degrees, but there's some good 30, 35 degree pitches in there. And it's all just draining off into this stream. So it's, I was thinking about that right from the start. It's like, this is going to be really hard sort of traversing a blood wagon through meter deep snow with, tree stumps and good sized drops everywhere and this huge ox of a guy came in one of those people who you can just tell by the size of his hands that he knows what he's doing you're like yeah i feel safe (laughs) shovels yeah Yeah. and he was just like oh i have not evacuated anyone from here for 22 years it's like okay you can do it and he's like just looked at me like what of course i can and it was still dumping so hard that there was Legend. no helicopter. Yeah. And this huge dude just gets on the front. There's a guy in front of him knocking some snow down. Then this ox is just death plowing, like his skis are nearly facing each other. And then <laughs> there's three 20 somethings, like gr- really green kids, ski patrollers, who have been given ropes at the back, just clinging on. And I've got my field of vision is about a two inch slit and I can just see these kids like jump turning and clinging (laughs) off these ropes, getting dragged down a hill. It's pretty, probably the most adrenaline I've had on a descent for a long time, but it was epic. They did such an incredible job. As everyone says in these situations, like you owe everything to the patrollers. I would, because I tried to wait bear a little bit and having done a few tears over the years, I thought, oh, maybe it's just the medial. And it was just dangling. The leg wasn't, the knee wasn't going to work at all. So, so you, so you kind of thought you, like you'd done the full, the full lot, the full works. I was, I was in denial for a couple of days, kind of hoping that it might sort of once it, it all died down, it might come back. But then I just would knock it or plant the foot a little bit, and it would fully just open up. And then the doctor made me when I went for the inspection. 
I was looking at it really carefully. And I don't know if you've ever had your knee examined after it's been injured, but anyone who has will know this. The doctor does a stress test on it. And if you're looking at it, you just can't relax and let him do it. So he let me, he said, he did something, got me to talk to the nurse and distracted me and then said, oh, just relax for a second. So I wasn't looking at it and I felt it. I reckon the bottom half of my leg was off at about 15 degrees. And he, I saw his face afterwards and he was like, yeah, that's pretty broken. (laughs) <laughs> no, it's like, oh, oh okay. god man so you've done a proper job so what have you what have you actually done then what's the full what's the full deal um fully snapped the mcl off the femur and as soon as apparently as soon as you break the mcl completely rupture that then you break the acl as well fractured the tibial plateau so the top of the outside uh bone which apparently is again really common in an acl break it always cracks tore the meniscus and then dislocated the kneecap. And then, and I'd, I'd kind of thought, well, it's just a ligament recovery. No, I've done that before, but I've got into physio now and it's, they've, they've all said it's a really complex sort of four stage rehab because you can't move the joint for the meniscus. You can't, but weight bear for the tibial fracture but you've got to try and get a certain amount of movement back so that you don't lose it for the ligament um, replacements. So I've had, I think I've got eight screws in there. I've got, like, you can have a look if you're on the videos. And, and I've got... Yeah, yeah, there we go. I've, yeah, I'll hold it there for a second. So this is the medial side that you can see, the inside of the knee. And... Yeah. They harvested the hamstring to replace the ACL, but then they've bolted on top an artificial brace on top of the MCL. So that's under the skin, obviously. Yeah, it looks like an eye. It's wow. got two cross beams and a central beam that are all bolted into the top of the femur and the bottom of the tibia. Holy I'm waking shit. up from them that you know about that that was really oh sore. yeah that's when i messaged you about this and you <laughs> and you you replied in a state state of some distress oh and i didn't know you'd had an operation so i was like and you know it was almost a bit like why the fuck are you texting me now kind of thing <laughs> and i was like hey like blah 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 so liverpool yeah let's chat about that and then and then you were like yeah just some operation it's the worst agony i've ever had in my life and i was like oh shit <laughs> Well, Sorry. I've, had, I've had that pain before when I had, because I had my right knee done 23 years ago and that was manhole surgery, like real old school. And I couldn't believe the precision and the lack of kind of collateral damage in this surgery, but the pain hasn't changed. But when I did it 23 years ago, they had patient supply morphine drip. So you basically get this button hanging next to your bed and whenever the pain the pain kicks in and you've got this green button and you just press that and then the button goes red and to start with it's only red for a minute and then as you have more morphine the time between the doses stretches out so you can't just keep dosing yourself with you can't get yourself a smack (laughs) habit yeah (laughs) but that was i remember that being pretty good and i remember it being tense as it was running out but being able to deal with it in Switzerland, they fully took the approach like, no, you don't need any opiates. You can just cope with this. If it gets really bad, then we might give you some. So I woke up and I've had eight screws put in my leg, stitches in the meniscus. Anytime you get in the cartilage, that's pretty much like, it feels oh, like someone's been at you with a chainsaw. And I'm on paracetamol. And I I was biting my the sheets and the blankets and then I started punching myself in the face. <laughs> like just I had such bad bruising on my forehead from just smashing myself in the face to try and get through it. And I've got a video, it's quite traumatizing. I really struggled to watch it. And it's after I've been punching myself in the face and I'm just shaking. I'm the <laughs> the guy up in the bed opposite me has just videoed me. He had called the nurses. But then he was so disturbed by it, he videoed me, just literally just shaking. And and so they whipped me out, took me down to the anaesthetist, and I got some fentanyl and some morphine. And it was starting to kick in. And the nurse administering it came over and just had a chat. 
because it's Swiss German hospital. And in that area, this sort of Romance, then Swiss German, almost no French. And there is predominantly some good English, but not a lot of people speaking English. So I'd kind of been in the dark for a couple of hours. And then this woman came over, fed me up with some really strong painkillers and just started stroking my forehead. And it had been a good, what, at that stage, five weeks since I'd had any form of human contact. You went... You went, like, didn't you? Oh, I'm wet. <laughs> I could, like a child. <laughs> yeah, like that time we were flying back from America and I was sat next to you on the plane and you were watching the house of sand and fog <laughs> turn around <laughs> and you were pretty much hysterically crying. <laughs> and I was like, you're right. And you were like, oh, like Ben Kingsley and Jennifer Connolly. I've subsequently watched that film and it is quite sad, but um, <laughs> it's planes though, isn't it? Planes yeah. get you. Well, I confess. Planes here. and planes and uh, and severe knee surgery get you. Yeah, yeah, that will do it for me. I've actually, to my great shame, I cried at twenty seven dresses on a plane once. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't mind a, a plane blob. It's, it's weird, isn't it? It's, yeah. um, I mean, I'm sure brighter people than us have studied why it is. It must, must be a thing. It must be like a combination of, you know. The environment, the atmosphere, the the small bottles of red wine, and the, well, you, and the you, volumes. You know it's weird because tomato juice tastes good on planes. It tastes horrific <laughs> everywhere else. It only you don't have it anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so on the operation though. So obviously, this was after you'd done this, done the rest of the ski Sunday season, which is obviously like quite a, quite a killer detail in this. So basically, you did, you did the, you had the accident. Yeah, and then but then you had to finish the se- the series, right? Yeah, so I did three weeks, another three episodes, just in a straight leg brace, crutching round, which was fine. I I couldn't wait there, but the knee was fairly stable. It was wrapped up, had some compression stockings on it, and it just it worked. So I was kind of there's a helipad just behind the Galaxy Building with these epic views over the whole valley, uninterrupted, so you can literally just clock round different angles and shoot some really nice different stuff. So we could go up and smash shows up. Shemi, bless her, got thrown in at the deep end, my co-presenter, because she's got no producer. And I'd been able, I was kind of wearing that hat up until I broke my knee and I was able to do it on the links, but then it relied, it came down to her and Zoid, the filming robot to pretty much produce these links for an hour long BBC show, like a two-person crew. It's like unheard of. And she stepped up to the plate. That was pretty phenomenal. And so we got those three shows out. And then we filmed one show and got everything done except for the voiceover by the Wednesday. So then I went in for the surgery on the Thursday, which bought me six days. It was the longest window we could build so I could have surgery and then have some time off to recover. And then... Yeah, the first day back up was horrific. The hardest day's work I've ever done, I think. Right? It feels like your knee's about to give birth. It's so swollen and just so painful. And poor Shemi, she could see me just grimacing and struggling next to her. So if she missed a line anywhere, I'd just be like, oh, and have to lie down and lift my leg up, try and get some fluid out of it, do some deep breathing, and then get stuck back into it. But we got it done. We got there and we got through it and it comes back to what we were saying earlier. I'd I'd gone there to do that job and I hadn't been able to do that job for six months. Like the thing that I love doing most of all. And the snowboarding would have been awesome, but that was the icing on the cake. It, I went there to go and make Ski Sunday and I'd promised myself I'd do that. So, yeah. We just got stuck in and they, they worked with me. They were amazing. Like You can imagine what it was like. It was epic snow for the first couple of weeks after I'd done it. And they would very tactfully keep their mouths shut and not talk about the epic runs they were having. Yeah, yeah. I mean, standard injury issue that, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed really because I think, I think that's, you're kind of making it sound like, yeah, I just got it done you know, like whatever, but it is, it is definitely psychologically quite, 
that's quite a challenge. I, yes yeah, and I mean, no. I think if I think if I think about what I'm like when I'm injured, I certainly wouldn't be presenting <laughs> BBC primetime TV. Sh- you know what I mean? Like I, I, I basically my mental. I struggle when I'm injured. Like just, but, I, do, I just do get a bit down and and like I, you know, I've got I've got to talk myself out of it a little bit. I'm just impressed that you were able to sort of compartmentalize it to that degree. I'm not sure that's that common, really. Yeah, may, maybe not. I but in my head, I I just I'm so pragmatic. I wish I was like more creative and flighty, but I'm really deep down. I'm actually quite. Uh, sort of I love a routine and planning and and everything when it's just so and in my head I'd looked at it there are people dying of cancer who aren't being allowed to change their isolation dates coming into New Zealand there there is a compassionate exemption but I'd read about people with far worse plights than mine not able yeah, to change their dates so in my head I was like well what am I going to do? I can't go back to New Zealand earlier. That's not an option. I'm in Larks for another five weeks. And the the idea of sitting around here and doing nothing when two people are going to try and battle through this show, I just thought, let's oh, do it. Oh, yeah, of course. It's it's admirable. Yeah. And, and yeah, you would have just been sat in a hotel room, basically, wouldn't you? So Exactly. And the other, the other side of it, the way... I mean, this is this is pretty funny with my family. A lot of people, my family have got an amazing history of injuries. And my older brother is phenomenal. He he considers himself one of the luckiest people in the world. But if if you talk to anyone else about this, he'd say he's, they'd just think he was insanely unlucky. I remember it, it kind of started. I remember him getting headbutted by a goat when he was six, but that wasn't, that wasn't <laughs> too bad. When Alex. He was, yeah, when he was uh, 17, he would have been because he just started driving. We we're playing football one Saturday and he took uh, a clearance in the eye at point blank range, like square in the eye socket. And his eyes swelled up pretty badly. We drove home down through these country lanes in the back of the Forest of Dean and met a tractor on the way back. I wasn't old enough to drive. So he's kind of driving one eyed and he swerved around the tractor and we skewered into the ditch. Car was fine. We we're both fine, but he head butted the steering wheel again. And what, right, on, right on this eye. So it swells. I think say his other, I think he's going to say his other eye. No, no, same one. So it went even more. And then he did something else. I can't remember what it was. He hit it again on something else. And the swelling was so bad. It detached the retina off the back of his eye. And uh, right. this was the, the end. It was the end of the football season. So he had this horrific injury that the surgery involved the same repair that you do on a, the sponson of an inflatable boat. That's the inflatable tube where you kind of put a, you cut the eye, eyeball open, put a pad inside it with a bit of string on it and then kind of glue it with another pad from the outside so you can compress it. So he had that right. done. We went down to South End swimming in the Thames. He got hep C and jaundice um so he'd had this like the same the same run (laughs) exactly and then so that was kind of a backdrop he got horrendously ill and because he'd laid up for however long he then got a hernia um so so that was a run and that came off the back of my younger brother getting run over the year previously and spending like really badly broke his one leg in 16 places the other in three like six months of surgeries a year in a wheelchair so those two summers were kind of back to back and then big al when it was out in greece a couple of years later and had and he was chopping through a scaffold pole with an angle grinder on his own someone should have been holding the scaffold pole and he was going through through it and he was holding the pole with one hand and the angle grinder with the other and as the pole got right to the end of the cut it sagged trapped the blade and chucked it back into his stomach and it wound oh up God. in his t-shirt until the motor clicked out and he just went <coughs> and he shouted at his mate he was like unplug it and his mate got it undone and the t-shirt's kind of wound up in the blade and he's hunched over and looking down and he's he's like oh my God, I think I've got away with this. And they start unwinding it. (laughs) And then the t-shirt just turns bright red. He lifts up his t-shirt and the front of his stomach flaps open. And he's went, (laughs) grabbed it and closed it. (laughs) But he's got what looks like. 
Pac-Man's mouth just kind of hanging out the front of his body. <laughs> I think he had something like 40 stitches internally and then 70 on the outside with a tube to drain off fluid. Spent six weeks laid up, unable to move. Eventually, he's in Greece when he did this, and eventually he's able to get up and he decides to walk down to the club to go and see everyone. He was the sailing manager at this uh, Sunsail Holiday Centre. And he goes to put on his work shirt. And because he's been laid up for six months, all kinds of things in Greece will start nesting in your gear. So he gets his shirt on and then he feels something on his chest move. And he's like, what's that? Looks down and there's a scorpion on the inside of his shirt. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. He's like, oh, what do I do here? Like I could lean forward, make enough space between my shirt and the body and just try and tap this out. Or I can I'll take it slow, undo the shirt, and then fold it backwards and flick it off. And he thinks, I'll do this properly. I'll undo the shirt. So he... <laughs> one button undone. He's just starting the second one, and the scorpion just goes Nyeh! and stings him in the chest. No way. Just, just above the cut. So he's like, bollocks. <laughs> Shakes it out. And he knows, like, they've got scorpions there, obviously. So he knows what to do because he's the sailing manager. And he thinks, okay keep the heart rate low, walk slowly because he doesn't want, what will happen is you'll lose the muscle function in half of your body if you go too fast. So he just, he knows he's got about 250 meters to walk to get to the sailing club. He starts walking nice and slowly and he starts feeling the poison, like pumping its way around his body. He's like, oh God. (laughs) He gets about 50 meters away from the club and all there is between him and the sailing club is a set of, 12 marble stairs and he's thinking if i, I thought you were gonna say like there. and then he fell into like a like quicksand <laughs> <laughs> well, nearly he got to the top of the marble stairs and his leg gave way and he fell head first down the stairs gashed his knee open no another four stitches in that one yeah and he, he always thinks of it he's like well i'm lucky i can still see and i he apparently missed his diaphragm by a millimeter when he did the angle grinder cut and if you if you take your diaphragm out then that's kind of the pressure that's holding all of your major organs in so yeah that 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 might that might challenge the, the legendary lee pragmatism to its full, <laughs> its full. That's, that's kind of what i was working on when it comes that's the that's the scale of injury so i'm thinking well it's just ligaments it's gonna fix and yeah and it, exactly it's exactly. a bit more complex than just an acl but I'd said to the doctor, the first question when I saw the surgeon, am I, do you think I'll make a full recovery? And he said, yes. Which is then the moment someone says that to you in your head, you're like, well, I'm going to do it. And it's just a question of how hard do you want to work now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which, you, and you know, and you've always had a formidable work ethic when it comes to those things on the family thing do you think your family's habit of electrocuting each other for fun had um much to do with (laughs) with like this stoic ability to withstand physical pain interestingly indirectly 100 percent yes should probably should probably contextualize that a little bit which was if i remember correctly your granddad rigged up a battery was that right a battery that you could electrocute each other with well i'll explain i'll explain what it is but first i'll explain the man who who instigated all of this because fundamentally he was the my mum's dad alf neil was the patriarch of the family and i think if you're talking about mentality towards things i mean my dad's insanely stoic i saw my dad pretty much cut off his toe when i was a kid and he just looked at my mum. He said, Jill, we've got a bit of a problem here. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's how you deal with that. <laughs> yeah, my granddad, stiff upper lip. Yeah, between those two, my dad and my granddad, who was, he was captured in 1939 on the western end of Crete by the Nazis. And he spent two years in a prisoner of war camp. First, he ate his shoes. Then he made, while he was making tea out of his belt, and then he ate his belt. And the lack of, they chewed the nails for iron. Like they were just mistreated horrifically. And he lost 
a couple of the muscles in his right leg died as a result. Uh, his ITB band, the outside quad muscle. And he was repatriated, but it just never, ever stopped him. He couldn't, he had the bandiest legs you'd ever seen. Like you could have got a fully grown sow <laughs> between his knees, but he <laughs> never, ever stopped him. It, like life was there to be lived. And the idea that something as pesky as a couple of missing muscles would stop you doing that just wasn't an option. So he was a brilliant academic though. He's a genius, member of Mensa, physics professor, but he was so passionate. He could have done so many things, but he was so passionate about the war not being repeated that he went into teaching and he loved science. So he's a physics professor. And at school one day, this guy, this kid's dad came in with a beautifully carved mahogany box. And he said, he was like, Alf, I found this in the loft and I figured you might know what it is. My granddad looks at this thing and instantly opens it up and he's like, I know what this is. And it's this beautiful electric coil with um, just a sliding bar on it that you rig up to a battery. And it was a Victorian electric shock machine for electric shock treatment. Um, and I I think it, it definitely, I don't know that it was like a heavy duty one that would have been used in uh, asylums. It looked like it was more kind of one of the domestic ones that would have been for sort of the shakes or anxiety, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When the laudanum, when the laudanum wasn't working, get, yeah. the, get the electric shocks out, yeah. And, and he used to, so he had this thing at home and he used to rig it up to a truck battery and we'd we'd sit around the Christmas dinner table and before dinner, the the electric shock box would come out. And we were 17, the full family, the three kids, uh, all their partners. So their three children and partners and all the grandkids were 17 people. And to give you an idea of my granddad's harebrained schemes, we used to sit around a full size snooker table because my gran had given him 500 quid to go out and buy a dining table and he'd got distracted at the snooker hall on the way to buy the dining table. And my older brother... Ah, I mean, what a, what a legend. <laughs> That's he legendary. Just sheets, That's so he bought two sheets of ply to go over the top of it. My brother spilt the gravy and was sat at the join one year. And he was, he was never really the same in my granddad's eyes after that. The gravy didn't come out of the bays on the snooker table. So... <laughs> <laughs> but the Classic. electric machine you'd sit there and it had these two brass handles and one person on each side of the table would hold it and then everyone else would link up you'd hold each other's earlobes and then my granddad would sit at the head of the table and make gags about how great his erections were from <laughs> being electrocuted regularly and <laughs> You'd, you'd hold each other's earlobes and then the current would pass through everyone and the first person to let go is out. So the circle gets smaller and smaller and then you'd start holding hands. And I, oh, it, was, it was hilarious. And I remember one year, Will Hughes. Well, I, 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 I've seen you play it. I've seen, I saw you all play it and uh, like I think played it as well. And it's like literally the happiest I've ever seen any family. Like <laughs> It was like... <laughs> <laughs> it was like incredible it was like just sheer joy of like it was i mean it was beautiful it was a beautiful thing it was a beautiful thing to see you know like just just this like just a family like in their absolute element like just all loving each other's company having an absolute whale of the time but definitely was like that's quite an instructive <laughs> well, imagine you seen Imagine you're able to, it's like that scene in The Simpsons where they're all electrocuting each other. It's, you're able, like you can't yeah. harm each other fundamentally. There's like so many volts, but not enough amps to harm you. So you're, like, you can really, really hurt each other, but with no lasting damage. And you're just laughing at each other. My older brother and I snuck it out when we were old enough to work out how to get it going. I think Alex was about 13. I would have been 11. And we were old enough to work out how to get this going. And he got on it. And obviously, one of you needs to hold each handle. And then the other hand is holding each other. So neither of you can work the slide. So we're like, oh, no. It was the ultimate moment of trust between brothers. Because it, one of you, you've then just got to, you, you've got to let your brother electrocute you. And with only one person holding on, it's really strong. It's going to be punchy. So he looked yeah. at me. 
And he said, he picked up the brass handles and he said, okay, just go real slow. See how much I can take. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, these are the keys to the kingdom. My older brother's holding onto a machine, which I can use. (laughs) So I start winding it up slowly and I get about a quarter of the way up and I mean, your veins, every muscle just starts clamping and your fingers clamp around the the handles so you can't let go. And then your wrists start cramping. So there's no way you can open your hands. And he's at that point. And it's like, it's at this point that anyone engaged in BDSM probably has a safe word, but we had (laughs) 11 and 13, we didn't have anything here. And he just kind of looks at me and I couldn't resist it. I just wanged it up to the top. (laughs) <laughs> the veins in his neck just went nuts his head snapped back his arms straight it was unbelievable it was one of the as you say one of the happiest moments of my life and i got it back down for about a second i let him have a second <laughs> and he looked at me we, our eyes made contact and he had this pleading look and i just rammed it straight back up to the top again because he hadn't had time to drop the handles and yeah he was I, I let him off after that. It was brilliant. And then he said, okay, now it's your turn. And that was the social contract between us that I knew I had to do it, that it wasn't fair. And I picked up the handles yeah. and took exactly the same treatment. But yeah, it's as you say, it's it was the most fun you could have as a family. And you, you were going to say something about Will. You made oh, Will do it. Yeah, Will Hughes. So one of Britain's best ever dry slopers who had that time and honored injury of the dry slope where you've shoved your arm through those Dendex diamonds enough times that you compound fracture your forearm, your arm literally gets snapped in two. So Will had done that probably, I think he'd done it two or three times and had got all the metal work to prove it. And he'd got, if you look at Will's forearm, it's a proper banana arm, a massive bend in it. And he was dating my sister and came round for Christmas and he got on the electric shock machine and yeah, it wasn't pleasant. It was like someone had lit him up. He properly was flashing. <laughs> <laughs> the electric in his arm, just, it wasn't good. And we all kind of realised we might have gone too far. God, that's so funny. I've not thought about that in years. <laughs> oh, funny what comes up, isn't it? it. Yeah. <laughs> So ski, so ski Sunday. Um, actually, before we before we go back to ski Sunday, um, one thing you did mention to me when we were WhatsApping earlier. Excuse me, you said that you wanted to talk about the fact that it has changed your perspective. The knee injury. So, what did you mean by that? Um, I can't remember now. Um, I think. Let me have a think. It's definitely, I I can't remember what I was talking about with that. I'm trying to think through it, whether it was, you remember what it was in the context of? Let's have a look. Let's get the old WhatsApp up. Yeah. I'll see if that jogs my memory. Uh, where is it? I'd like to talk about the injury a bit and its wider effect on my outlook, is what you said. I think, that, well, we kind of covered that a little bit. I think with, with the knee, I've definitely... Uh, that That positive mental attitude has been... It's been there, but I think I've come to understand it a little better would be the best way to describe it. I've always just kind of charged through things and just done things. When I I talked earlier about moving out of Switzerland and I look back on that and it was a huge, another huge move and I was really settled there, but I just didn't question it. If I think something is going to happen then I will just accept it and get on with it and that's 
I've come to understand that that's been a realization with the knee this time that there's moments where I've sort of thought this is rubbish, but then just thinking, well, what are you going to do? You're going to sit around here thinking it's rubbish or are you going to work out how to make it not rubbish? And that's moving forwards. And that that's just it. And it's a long, it's going to be a long one. I think nine months physically, but having done this before, I know it'll be more like 18 months mentally probably until I forget about it. But I have, I have such a good life. And if I was looking at how I've, first of all, where I'm at, the, where I was at when I did this injury, if this had happened any time in the last five years, physically, I probably would have struggled with it. But ever since I, I ended up with an ectopic heartbeat, which is when your heartbeat goes, uh, your heart adds an extra beat every now and again. I've got stupidly slow heart resting heartbeat of around 34 to 36 when I'm sleeping, which in the hospital caused all kinds of problems because the alarm keeps going off when you drop below 40. So the nurses run is in. That, is, 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 that, is that just like a, a fitness thing? Because because that's obviously, so, like you know, they, they say that like athletes have famously low resting heart rates. Is that just because you're in good shape or is that, or is that just because it's something it's else? always like that. But I can, I started noticing it when I was, I used to do a lot of free diving and spear fishing when I was in Greece, when I was like sort of 18, 19. And we, there was this Greek guy I used to do it with and we'd do breathing exercises and look at heart rates. And I discovered then that I can control my heart rate. So with breathing, I can slow it down. I can take my heart rate from about 48, which it would be if I was moving around or talking now. And just with, some deep breaths and concentrating on calming myself, I can take my heart rate heart rate down to 40, 42. Wow. Which That's is amazing. Quite, yeah, it's quite weird. And I've spoken to some doctors about it and they were just like, never heard of that. But noticeably, I think I think it's fairly natural, but being able to do it instantly to make a decision to do that. I've read a lot about the flow state, and I wouldn't say that I can access flow state that idea of almost removing yourself from your head i've had it i think i've been there once or twice i was in a very near miss in a car accident where i definitely had it where i was able to access it but um i've gone uh, spe- uh, what the flow particular- state as in the, the flow state that that like this sort of yeah that that's now like quite a common sort of thing that people talk about that i mean my understanding of that is that it's my understanding of that is basically because i've thought about this as well is that that's what's different about professional athletes essentially that they can kind of tap into that much more readily than ordinary people can i think most people can you know i always think you know when you play football and you do something really good <laughs> and it's like <laughs> where the fuck did that come from do you, know, do you know what i mean like and 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 it's almost like you your body just takes over like it's an instinctive thing there's no way it's a it's a rational thought you know you just it, it's just you're like what like where did that come from or, or like when you ride or like when you're surfing or whatever like th- those th- those something your body just takes over in a different way and it's not a mental thing that's that's my understanding of that and i always just sort of thought that yeah like professional athletes have the ability you know if you look at like a like a tennis final about as tense a, a situation in sport as you're ever going to get like fifth set of like a you know grand slam final that ability to kind of like control that situation and make those shots on your own terms i always think like that's that's the that's the professional has earned the right to kind of control those moments like much more red do you, do you know what i mean does that make sense that's kind of the way that i sort of think about 100%. it it's it's almost as i understand it i read the rise of superman that if you, if you haven't yeah, read, read it, it yeah, yeah. yeah fantastic book and an amazing insight into the mental progression of action sports athletes but that idea that you let intuition take over, that you let go the conscious brain. And 
I'm fascinated by this. I've, I've, I'd started making a link the other day. I was watching a piece someone had made. I think X Games made it on Zeb Powell. The guy won the knuckle huck in 2020. He's got ADHD and he talked about flow state in that final. He said, I just tapped into my flow state. And you're like, okay. And I was trying, I was wondering, like, is there a link in the rise in flow state, in the rise in something in conditions like ADHD or ADD? I, yeah, Travis Ta- Rice Taz, it, have you read his, sorry, sorry to interrupt have you read Taz's interview with Zeb and Curator yes and that's what fed in, me into in the, the other new one. fantastic brilliant brilliant interview yeah it's really good isn't it and and you, you're right he talks about it a lot doesn't he and he talks about that yeah he, he, he almost makes it sound like he can just control it at will almost yeah and so Travis Rice exactly the same thing what if we're on the cusp of finding out. I mean, this is, a, this is a massive speculation, but you know me, I love I love a grand idea. What if ADD or ADHD is a window into mental superpowers, that it gives you access to this incredible brain? I mean, the thing that I found reading The Rise of Superman in 2018 is that it appears to be one of the most dangerous states available to humans because I think that book was written in 2014 and even by 2018, so many of the people used as anecdotal evidence have been killed by misadventure, probably extending themselves beyond the flow state. And that's what I took home from that book was, yes, this is an incredible state to be able to access, but knowing when the window of opportunity for safely accessing that has passed appears to be a major pitfall. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. So to bring it back to what we were talking about, you were saying that, um, yeah, that you, you noticed your ability to kind of control your own physical when, responses in a way, but by no, talking about no, that slowing is, your heart rate down and stuff. And that was an insane tangent. I I was actually getting back to that heart rate idea of the ectopic heartbeat. My heart was beating upside down and it was deeply unpleasant. It was, the doctor told me it's completely harmless, but it had come off the back of, I'd started getting healthier and healthier, but I was still, I love a big party. I can't, I get such excitement and I'd had a couple of big nights and kind of mid forties, you're starting to think, I had this big night and then I went out really long, couple of really long touring days and really pushed myself. And then this upside down heartbeat, kind of added heartbeat started coming in. Went and saw the doctor who said it's completely harmless, but um, it'll be aggravated by alcohol. And that was January 2019. And in the two years since then, I've steadily been tidying things up just slightly because of that. That was the kind of last kick on I needed, but my body was in the best condition it has been in, in probably the last 30 years since I'd started smoking at the age of 12 (laughs) in January this year. Undoubtedly, I'm a healing machine. And I (laughs) I looked at that as a positive. I thought, you know what, this injury couldn't have come at a better time. I haven't, I've had a couple of small ones like medial tears, some shoulder injuries, a couple of broken ribs in the last 10 years, but nothing beyond a four week recovery. And so if I'm on, if I'm surfing, snowboarding, skateboarding, mountain biking, I would say 150 to 200 days every year. That's 2,000, like somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 days that I haven't had a big off. So it, um, as my dad says, if you want to dance, you've got to pay the band. And I've, that's a lot of dancing. So in my eyes, it's not a deeply unfair um, ratio. Like if I've got to do nine months to have 10 years of an insane amount of fun. And that part of that, going back to that, point about the the drinking and the tidying up it was underpinned by the idea like I'm definitely facing my mortality in the sense that I live like I love 
skateboarding, snowboarding and surfing so much and I can see the end. You know, like whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe 40 years away, I'm starting to think about the end of that. And the idea of having a few drinks and not being able to do those, like the compromise to me seems really small. And I, I'm definitely going to drink again. But at the moment, I've made myself a pact that I'm not going to booze till I can snowboard or skate again. That's good. Good shout, man. Yeah, I'm on a I'm on a little booze break at the minute, much as it doesn't look like it, but these are alcohol free beers. Um Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's, no, good. it's more a mental health thing for me. But yeah, for, right. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Um Yeah, I mean I think with me it's like I talked about it before and like I definitely have like a feast and famine sort of approach and I've definitely spoken to you about this. Like I just I just think I've realized that it's just some kind of weird rhythm that I seem to have built into me really. Um, I, I don't know where it comes from, but it's like, yeah, like I'm like you, like a piss up, you know, like we party, 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 like, or not even party, 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 more like life, 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 you know, like cram it all in. Well, and then it's it's and, it's, then, it's, and, and then but I, like the older I get, that like the the less sustainable that is. So I need to have these like periods of flogging myself, salmon <laughs> salmon stuffing, as we used to call it back in the day. Um, but I was going to turn my heat up a little bit actually. But you know what I mean? Like you you need you need those. I need that balance a bit more. I think as I've got a bit older, I've realised. Well, I just I've never been in that because I've never had an adult routine. I've never been in the habit of finishing work and what well, weirdly I have been in the habit of finishing a job and then having a massive blowout, but I've never been in the habit of finish work, get home, crack a beer. So it's not for me. It's more about when I see my friends, then you want to, you get really excited and you send it. And the, that was the issue, I think, was kind of getting that under control. But it's yeah. still, I see living in New Zealand, I've made some really, really solid friends there now. But for the first five or six years of living there, I, I didn't have that crew. I had a small crew, actually, who'd known me in my 20s. But it's growing old, like as men, friendship is a really interesting concept. I'm finding now like loneliness is something that could find you quite quickly. I think in old age as a man, because we don't nurture those social ties and I cherish, I still cherish them so much, but I find increasingly because there's so much distance between me and my friend, like your close friends. When I see people, it takes longer and longer sometimes to find your 20 year old selves or the the effortless, maybe not the twenty year old self, but the effortless friendship. There are a couple of people who you don't miss a beat with. You're one of them. Christian's one of them. But increasingly, there are people where that, that there's a distance, a social distance growing there. And you're quite booze... good. You're quite good with your friendships, though. You're quite good. You look after your friendships. You work hard at them. Yeah, I don't know if I do. I'd say. I would say I'm guilty of it coming second to work. Like social social relationships will come second to work, I think, sometimes. And I and but I'm aware of it. And I think that's the first stage of trying to uh, correct that. I mean, I I I'm a you, you have to work at your friendships. Like you really do. Like you have like if you don't, they do you can't take them for granted. Like it's not something that's always gonna be there. You have to put the time in like any other relationship especially with like you know like when you so you know like if you take our friendship you know you obviously we only see each other every few years now because you're in new zealand so it's kind of even more important isn't it yeah it's um, yeah, um, um, i think that's the part of it i've got something here i want to pull up i've sean got me a meditation course for christmas with sam harris waking up you ever come across that Oh, I listen to him. He's got the podcast, doesn't he? Yep. Yeah. So he does he's this. Got the he's got. He's got the. He's got the political podcast as well, right? He's got. He, that's the guy, isn't it? Yeah. Because I listened to him about the capital insurrection. 
um joel muzzy sent it me in fact which is quite random joel because yeah. occasionally um like i mean probably like you in touch with joel over like instagram and you know the occasional message or whatever God, i haven't seen him in fucking years but you know count him as a mate kind of thing and he just randomly sent it to me and just said oh you'll like this check this out so i listened to the whole thing and it was like and then at the end i was like oh that's the fucking meditation guy <laughs> he's got this like crazy political podcast as well yeah well, i'm not amazing. but i hear I, I hear the meditation thing is really good it's amazing and i'm rubbish at it and i've been desperate i'm not as disciplined as i'd like to be but kind of getting trying to get my head around that and work out at the moment they're saying like i'm really stuck i kind of my self is behind my eyes like you're you like i view things through my eyes and they're trying to get you out of that it's a really interesting idea trying to see things as consciousness as a cloud or sounds sights everything as just being there and trying to get you out from behind your eyes but oh my god as a concept to close your eyes and start actually leaning into that is pretty difficult, but it, it's just practice. I look at it as I med- I've taken the approach with meditation that it's like skateboarding. It's really fucking hard and it takes loads of goes to get even more results. But so, and that's the mentality I've come at it with, but there's a brilliant conversation in there going back to what we we're talking about uh, with relationships is this guy, a uh, poet called David White ever come across him and he's got a book um brilliant poet there was there was a conversation with uh between sam harris and david white on the waking up podcast and he talks about this book he's written called three marriages and the idea that we have this relationship with ourselves the three marriages of life a relationship with ourselves a relationship with our family your wife your children brothers sisters mother father and then a relationship with your work and the constant flux that you find yourself in between those three marriages and how they're all you're changing constantly. And the idea of a marriage to a person, a partner, and then your, your children essentially as well, that, that contract and how you, how you change as a person, how they change as people and constantly trying to renegotiate that is that sounds really that sounds right on my alley that i'd quite like to read that it's a fascinating idea absolutely like it's really really good it's and that's those kind of convert those conversations have really helped me get stuck into it because i was very skeptical of it at the start sean's been sort of dragging me heels first into first yoga and i've been I might... Yeah, I know she's been like that with me as well. But I might, I might give this a shout because I'm the same in meditation, yoga. I'm like, I started seriously doing yoga four years ago. Basically, at Sean's prompting as well, to be honest. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much daily now, really. Um, and again, that's a mental health thing, really, more than anything. I, at the time, I thought, well, it'll be, I could do a bit of mindfulness in my life. Could do with sorting my hamstrings out. So, you know, but I was quite blokey with it. You know, I think blokes approach this in in that way, don't they? You're like, why can't I touch my toes yet? You know, it's like, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, you have to obviously learn that. Yeah. I'm not even going to go there because that's, well, that's just, yeah. but you know, you know what I'm saying? And, and yeah, well, meditation I've, tr- I've tried and I just, I've never gone with it. So maybe it's time to give it another go. Yeah. Um, that you've mentioned mental health. I would definitely, it's definitely there for me. And I I love, I do a couple of classes with Sean each week. She teaches in Wanaka, but I still do. I have a subscription to Glow and there's a guy on there called Jason Crandall and exactly what you talked about, that sort of the male approach to yoga, he's, it's just ever so slightly different. There's the poses are different. The moves are different and having a male uh, lead on it, I find really different. And just, it suits me a little bit better. Plus he's an old snowboarder and skater. So there's a couple of classes on there for a post skate or a post snowboard, just hip opening, 10, 12 minutes that you can smash out. And they're so useful. Just knowing that you've got a little bit of that there. And he does some really, really good, like no chat, just breath centered stuff where he literally just tells you where to move. And it's, it's, I find that really good. So I cheat on John a little bit with that, but. Yeah, I'll give that a go. I'll give that a go for sure. 
Yeah. I'm reading a really interesting book at the minute, just on this, going back to what you were talking about, about the the three marriages idea. Uh, it's called Conflicted. It's about, it's like how to have good arguments is is the sort of like premise of it. And it's really interesting because it's, it's about, it's lessons from like hostage negotiators and um, like Nelson Mandela's in there a little bit. Right. And it's, it's really fascinating. But one of the interesting things is uh, face. It's, he refers to it as like your public face and your private face and the importance, you know, like saving face kind of thing, but like how much that's a driver of, of conflict really. And like how much you, like you know your inter- your public face and your internal face and like how far apart they can be and like how they can if if you're if you feel if you publicly feel like your private face isn't being respected that can really lead to conflict like quite quickly but obviously because you're not displaying that private face you're only displaying your public face that's re- that that's can lead to couples like quite quickly getting into ruts of like non-communication so it's kind of like it's it sounds quite self-helpy but it's really not it's it's very fascinating very briskly and very That's briskly a... and functionally written you know so i quite like it well, i'm fascinated by that because i've spent the last two weeks um no the last week exactly the last week defending um the editorial decisions we made on ski sunday for phil young's diversity piece in the last episode on various social platforms. And there's that idea that your public face used to be about your community, your immediate community and probably your work. But now that public face is out there in the world for everyone to see. And you've got to try and defend that because if you put anything out there, anyone can see it. So like the level of humiliation that's now available to us is huge so people galvanize and people will dig in on ideas it's it's potentially at the root of some of the like of the sort of immovable um yeah yeah well I mean, you should check we have now and and that's yeah. what i found i try and i like to think of myself as a malleable mind open to lots of concepts and the last week has taught me like as i've started to find myself getting galvanized in thought and setting my defenses against people. And it's not me. It's not something I'm comfortable with. No, well, I'm quite similar. I think we're quite similar, aren't we? I think we both broadly have like quite a positive view of human nature at the end of the day. And yeah, like I think almost the, one of the, I said this to you in one of the messages when we were chatting, it's quite it's kind of like yeah you're talking about your faith in human nature being quite shaken there really in in a certain way aren't you because of how entrenched people are about these things which is a big theme of this book as well not to like harp on about this book i just bring it up because i'm reading it at the minute but like that's that's also a big a big subject of this book like online debates and like how how do they get so entrenched so quickly like what is what is going on there like why why are people so incapable of changing their mind i mean if you take the phil thing um so i'm not going to say who it was but we both kind of had a look at this online debate uh, this online comment about so phil put a thing on linkedin about the diversity piece and Mike just outed the person there <laughs> some somebody put a comment basically which was like um you know Oh right, this is all. Uh, this is all basically wokeism gone mad. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but like, and, and yeah, what, what was interesting? Usually, what like uh, what was interesting? Yeah, yeah, that was that was what was fascinating about this because I don't particularly want to debate like what was being spoken about. But what was really interesting about this scenario is like for once, because you see this all the time, don't you? You know, in in online debates, like oh, it's probably like a f- the BBC this or the government are doing this or like it's people trying to, you know, like these outlandish theories about why why things be- happen take place. But in this case, we actually know why this happened because you were involved in it. <laughs> and like, so like, and this lad has put this thing going like, well, obviously this is the BBC's woke agenda gone mad. And you've like quite politely gone on there and said, 
well, no, actually, that's not what happened at all. <laughs> like, what happened here is me, the producer, and Phil had a chat, and we just thought it'd be a good piece because we agree with the premise that there's not enough diversity in winter sports. It was that simple. So, kind of went back to him with facts, which were, and, he, and he's a mate of yours. So, like, and you were very polite, but then his reply was, wasn't like, oh, oh, sorry about that. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Now you say his reply was like, it just doubled down, just like, well, you know, it's typical race baiting. And, and, and I was just, and that's what fascinates me, that thing that it's like, where is that coming from? Like, why can't that individual, like, how is it, like, you know, you, like, you just described it as like this malleable mind, this like willingness to change your mind or whatever. Like, it's just instantly entrenched and just instantly broadcasting is like what I consider to be like quite outlandish views, but they're really shared by a lot of people, but not, but this not listening back, to any this reason. Comes, this comes back to your public and private faces. Like he's, he's chosen a very, like, I mean, LinkedIn is a professional platform. That's so not it's a DM. Not, <laughs> it's not a personal view. So he's left himself with nowhere to go. He can't back down. He has to double down on his ideas. Otherwise, He's public, and we've forgotten how to say sorry. We've forgotten how to apologise, and people, yeah, that that aspect of public life, that digital self, is is not apologising. People, and I've I've come to the conclusion after this week, and I've I've written so many replies, and then I'm reading them back, checking for typos, and just checking. Like I've got into that good journalistic habit of like, and I just delete them now. I just outside. delete them. And it's that idea that you are not going to change anyone's mind online. And even if I change their mind, they're not going to let me know. They probably, they might think about it. You might leave them with something to think about, but publicly they're going to double down. And the the threads that I got involved in on Twitter after the show. I, I saw, I, saw I, I, I read a few of them. You, you had know, a couple just, of like proper, you know, like Celtic warrior sort of, 8164 like you know that, that type of individual on twitter who was basically going like i swear the bbc wants wants to make us all feel bad about our lives and you know like just all that stuff you know and, and i was like well wow, basically you know, they thought is... we called them racists it was the they it, there, there was an element there where people just hadn't listened to the message and i it was really hard with only 15 minutes on such a big subject but yeah I just came to that conclusion. You are not going to change anyone's mind on social media. The only way to do this is to sit down and talk to people face to face and show them that's how yeah, you I do mean, it. Social, it, it is the, the public face thing is mad though, isn't it? Cause you, sometimes I think, do you, do you realize people can read this? Right? <laughs> you do realize that <laughs> I, I kind of think it's almost, you know, everybody, everybody wants a voice don't they you know everybody wants to wants to feel like their opinions important validation and, you know and pre-internet essentially you were the boring man in the pub weren't you you know like if you if you if you wanted to talk about like how vaccines are bad like 20 years ago you were essentially the guy in the corner of the pub that was talking about it and everyone would very slowly pick the pints up and <laughs> find the new table and like you know and that was kind of the extent of it really or they might be writing letters to the local paper or you know what i mean like there was you didn't have that many options to kind of talk about these things but now obviously you just can really really talk about that stuff and you can really broadcast it and i i just it often i think it's like almost like the, the kind of thwarted small town intellectual you know who's finally got a voice and you're all gonna fucking listen <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and cause sometimes I'm just like, like, especially like you, you go on Facebook and people are just ranting away about stuff again, like, and yeah, fair enough. If you don't, I'm just using vaccines cause it's a handy example. Like again, I don't have a particular dog in the fight. Like I'm going to take the vaccine. If you don't want to take it, fucking good luck to you. Um, but like, you know what I mean? Like it's, a, it's quite a common thing. And then just, and just people like just going on and on and on about it. And, and he's just like, just like, come on, like, what, what, what's, it, what are you gaining here? Like, what, what is it? And, it, and the only thing, I, the conclusion I can come to is like, they're just gaining the ability to speak because they can essentially. And you know, now you can find that little tribe that will agree with you, and it's all getting 
ever more entrenched, isn't it? It's well, we we know what's happening. I saw a chart on the Economist about uh, the the health of democracy globally, <laughs> and it's not looking good. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's another one, isn't it? That's another debate. But on the Ski Sunday thing, though, so we should let's talk about that properly a little bit. Um, how, yeah, we we surprised. I guess that's my question. No, 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 no. Exactly as. Interestingly, I'd expected the slaughter for prancing around on snow, and that didn't come. The response to having a show out on snow was really, really positive. But for this, I, I've i tested the water before, and I think you might have seen it. I, I kind of put some sort of left-leaning posts up after Boris Johnson, sort of his first couple of monumental mess ups around covid and i realized very quickly that the the ski sunday kind of audience is a large chunk of that are sort of gammons yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brexit and gammon who don't want that kind of behavior so um yeah it's it, i knew it was coming i was under no illusion that we were going to get quite a bit but I was just I was, it was fascinating watching people comment like I turned this rubbish off straight away like I don't need to be called a racist and you're like if you turned it off how do you know what it said like really really basic stuff people trying to argue it was it was just knee-jerk reaction like no, no one actually listening to what was said for the most part and the few people that did were just yeah they're outraged so, I just so don't angry. get why it's a, why it's a. I just don't get why it's a. I don't get why it's a contentious point though, because the, the only point that's being made is the more the more visibility visibility leads to more participation. That's the only point that's being made, and that and that is just like such a self evidently obvious point that because because I, I saw a lot of people kept saying like, well, you know, well, what about like there's not many skiers in Angola, you know, like just people saying stuff like that, like, and, and you're just a bit like, well, yeah, obviously that, 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 that's not disproving the point. That's, <laughs> that's actually the point, you know, like, and I don't, but I don't understand why that's a, a, a remotely controversial observation at all. I just don't understand why people get so exercised by that. Yeah. It, it it's literally the subject matter. I, I think it's, I, don't, I, I genuinely don't. Uh, you know, when you say that, I can't tell you what they're thinking. I, do, I don't. I genuinely don't understand where it's coming from because it's not. It's not like you're peddling hate at any stage. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong. I'm just saying let's let's open the doors a little bit. I don't understand what so, uh, what someone has to lose by doing that. Oh. Yeah, well, it's like our, our our man on LinkedIn who one of the things that he said was like, it's classic. Div- like, so, I think one of the phrases was, "Some of us think there's too much talk about race in the media." Um, it's classic divide and conquer, and I was just a bit like, "What does that actually mean? Like, how does this possibly affect you? You're a white man who's presumably got like." why is i just fundamentally don't understand what that statement means like what divide I, try, I, tried, that... I tried to see this from his perspective and i thought about things where re- areas where race shouldn't be an issue something like a school where it's there for everyone it's compulsory and you all do it so like it should just be colorblind like, you don't see it like everyone in your community goes to that school and they learn that's that's the idea of it and if it's a public school uh, um if it's a state school then the funding's the same for everyone and everyone does exactly the same thing but when you have so potentially if you may, if you're in a school or if you're in government say or civil service where it is it's a democratic process and there should be no barriers then race potentially isn't an issue and shouldn't be an issue. I was trying to think along those lines of, okay, if you make race an issue where it doesn't need to be, then that could be seen as 
a, a mechanism. Yeah, but, but in, like, but even that language, I disagree. And I know you're being, I know you're being devil's advocate, but even that, even that language, I, I just completely disagree with because, like, it's not like people are sat around going, "Should we just make a massive deal about race?" Like, it's not. This hasn't like developed in a vacuum. You know, exactly. like, the, like if you look at our country, our country is founded on slavery and colonialism. Like, you know, like that's an inescape. Those are inescapable facts. Like the lifestyle that we have has has come about because we used to enslave people and um and go around the world Steal like, taking out to stealing re- resources like that that's just those are just facts like you can't you can't deny that so it's quite a obvious case of cause and effect is <laughs> is going on here and you know when, when obviously you look at something like windrush generation which is very recent and you know that, that that there's people alive that have been affected by that clearly you know like basically nationalized discrimination for one institutionalized discrimination for one of a better phrase like that those are those things happen those are facts and so it's so it's so people and and those have repercussions on ordinary people going about their lives try to live normal lives and those people, I think, are well within their rights to stick their hand up and say, hang on, that's not right. You know, like we shouldn't have, like, you know, we know this. So to, to, sort, to sort of say, like, when people say things like playing the race card and, and just like asinine comments like that, or, you know, like we think there's too much talking about this in the media. It's like, well, it's, it's not just come from nowhere. People are just sat around going, like let's try and make make that white guy watching ski sundays life more unpleasant by pointing do you know what i mean like that's that's not what's happening <laughs> what's it's, happening here is people are pointing out like societal cause and effect it's led to a situation that we have now and very gently and politely suggesting that we might want to just try and give it a, you know it's like you say it wasn't even like a, it wasn't even like it was inflammatory it was just a bit like have you thought about it this way should yeah. we just look at it in a different way? Like I just, I just find the, like you say, the instinctive, like I'm not watching that rubbish. It's like what? Like, yeah, you can't why, tell me why? this, and that's what it is. It's and I, I tried to get my head around it, and I was, I can't. I tried to look for the post actually, because I was talking to the series producer for Ski Sunday, John Nicholson, and I asked him. I said, John, like the people who are going to comment on this are probably going to be racist like they're racist brexit vote not brexit's not fair i can't bring that into it but they're racist gammon and can i just reply to all of them the same way that seth MacFarlane did to his tweets around black lives matter where he said fuck off racist and john john suggested no I'm like, <laughs> that might john not be a like, good idea. can't do that ed no and but that's kind of how i felt it's like and there, there was a woman who put it much more politely than me on twitter that night she said nice to see all the racists outing themselves in their distress sunday feature and that's it i've tried really hard to see a different perspective on it but i can't can't understand why you would be offended by that what well i just think i just think if you have other than to protect your privilege other than that you're a bit racist I mean, let's just call it what it is. Like, I think I think that's the thing that kind of gets me about this whole kind of culture war thing that's going on at the minute as well. Like, in especially in the UK, like, I mean, just just I just fucking own it a bit more. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, try to pretend it's not about that. Like, is is just it's it's just laughable, isn't it? Really, you know, like people because there's this whole thing at the minute you I'm, you I'm not sure if you know about it there's this woman called Corrine Fowler who's this woman who's this academic who's doing this research into national trust properties and she's getting like character assassinated right now by the by all the mainstream press because she's like dared to say that like by the way a lot of these nas- national trust properties that we um all enjoy were, were were originally built and owned by slave owners and like we i'm just mentioning that <laughs> you know like and she's like because because it comes down to this whole thing about like well unless you tell that type of history then people are going to keep perpetuating this idea that it does occur in a vacuum you know what i mean like and, and, 
picking up on and that. She, na- oh, sorry, carry on. Well, I was just going to say, and she's she's been like absolutely kind to this woman. You know, she's had she's been like basically had proper hatchet jobs in the mail. You know, like columns written about her, like, and that it, it is gaslighting. Like, there's no, like it is basically saying to people like not only like do we not want to hear it but also like you're wrong that didn't happen and even if it did happen we don't want to talk about it and if you bring it up you're actually you know you're not properly british which is kind of like the way it's going at the minute and you know like i just i just go on the most inflammatory comment is that from phil's piece that people latched onto was from salema um where he said why post segregation outdoor recreation was created as a white safe space that's that was i'm paraphrasing slightly but that was what salema said and that really that was the trigger point i think for a lot of people and people couldn't didn't listen to the fact that he was talking about the US. He was talking about post-segregation. But I went and did a little bit of reading afterwards so that I could adequately defend that statement late when, when we got online. And there was a study by the National Health Board looking at exercise in the US saying that exactly what Phil and Salema had said in the piece, that uh, immigrants to the UK and... Um, um, people of colour in the States post-segregation were, were, were based in cities. And the rural areas had been the most conservative-minded areas. They'd been the least progressive. And in the States, there had been the monstrous amount of lynchings that had taken place had taken place exclusively in forests and national parks. So there's um, historical trauma for those people in those areas. Like they're terrifying spaces for people of colour. So and I was kind of looking at that and I just thought, wow. This... And I tried to post those links for a couple of people or quote the article for them and people just don't want to know. They literally head in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, but, and but again, like deny, you know, just shutting that down is even like a line of conversation is again, it's just, it's just, it is this thing of like, making out that it that this is all occurring in some kind of vacuum designed just to annoy people and that's not that's not what's going on what's going on is people are responding to generations and centuries of real things that that actually happened <laughs> and I, I i don't know i just think it's pretty i thought the whole point about history was you're supposed to kind of learn from it and you know like take lessons from it not not be like i don't like that bit I don't want to worry about that. That's <laughs> well, like, history is written by winners, Matthew. Well, yeah. yeah, but it's it's interesting, isn't it? You do wonder what what's going to say about this current era. Really, I think I think it always comes out in the end, doesn't it? Oh, we're we're really. in we're living through one of the most fascinating times in human history. We have access to yeah. technology. We have no understanding of its power. It's changing us frighteningly quickly our habits i mean and you look at like the the combination of the pandemic and it's lockdown the associated lockdowns and then social media and the technology we have access to this is going to be there will, there will be endless books written about this period of human development and i it'll be i mean at the moment, I don't think they'll be positive. I don't think this is a good thing for us. But it it could be. In the same way we talked about my granddad earlier and the effect the war had on him and his generation and the positive things they did in the wake of that, could the pandemic be our generation's war? Could this be what facilitates massive social change? Yeah, well, I think without a doubt. Hey, well, I remember it actually, just because you just mentioned the internet, I listened to a great podcast about the printing press, which is really brilliant. It's about, um, it's, is it, it's Gutenberg. Is that the guy that invented the printing press? But it's yeah. about like, he was basically an entrepreneur. Steve, yeah, from Cocoon. Ste- yeah, from that's why I was like, I was like, Steve, <laughs> Steve Gutenberg. It's like, <laughs> but um, he was an entrepreneur, basically. 
and then and then this podcaster like you could consider him to be the Steve Jobs of the day but like it's a really fascinating story because the printing press you don't actually consider that somebody just made it up you know it was just like wow that'd be that'd be handy wouldn't it having books like that you could print I'm gonna make that as a business um and like how it you know very obviously changed the world it's it's very very interesting in the in the context of of what you're talking about because it's it's comparable isn't it in terms of impact well it's, um, it's hey right I'm gonna go for a week beginning of widespread opinion yeah, yeah go for right. it. again like before before like <laughs> with books it was a one way thing wasn't it you're taking the knowledge in with the internet now you can like you can you can rant out rant outwards as well you ever read that blimey i've had a lot of yeah I've, i have read that yeah it's good i'm real that's I helping I help me formulate my um that's underpinned my um mentality around the recovery <laughs> like, shit could be so much worse yeah it's uh, i went through quite a period of like reading about like all that sort of south pole literature and mm -hmm. um that's definitely quite a crazy story isn't it like they they try and go and get some penguin eggs in the middle of the antarctic winter don't they in the dark just wandering yeah, around in, wild. in a black storm for four months they're out of their fucking yeah. mind <laughs> I just don't yeah. understand. I mean, I've I've got experience of sailing. What they try, just what they were doing in the boats was pretty radical for back then. Yeah, I've yeah, deeply upset the obvious decline in wildlife. What they describe in the oceans and around Antarctica. Yeah, no, it was yeah. It's it's strange. It's really really difficult. I and I just. Like the the sadness that permeates his life afterwards, that at twenty three or whatever he is when he comes out twenty four, he's ba the rest of his life is basically a shadow of those of that expedition. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a great book. Right, Ed, that's me restarting after a little break. Um, okay, so I don't do this that often. But I did ask for some questions on Instagram and you probably saw I got a pretty decent response. So, and you said you got a couple. You say you got a good one. I was joking. Someone asked me what my stance was. All oh, right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I did get, well, I did get a couple like that. So, um, so I'm just having to read. Before. No, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you known me? I don't even know what my own stance is. I don't care what anyone else is. Um, <laughs> my stance is like, oh, that looks about right. Okay, right, questions. This is quite a good one. I quite like this. I think it's by Sophie Carts. Did he ever have a moment you felt close to throwing in the towel? If so, what was it? In what sense, do you think? What does she mean? In life? I guess like, yeah, I guess, you know, like a low point. I had one period in my life. This is a really good one. I haven't really thought about this, but it's I had one period. It's, it's a good question though, isn't it? Really good question. Um, I had one, one period. And like most people, I imagine, with the benefit of hindsight, is probably the most powerful learning experience or period of my life. I left school pretty early on, 16, 17, and started working summer seasons. Uh, I grew up in a sailing family, uh, windsurfing. Old granddad Alf that we talked about earlier got his hands on one of the first windsurfers in the UK. Used to cling to that thing in the Thames estuary. And... He got us all into sailing as a family. So when I left school, I just instantly, that was something I could fall back on, teaching windsurfing and sailing in gravel pits in Chelmsford. And met a guy there who took me out to Greece, started doing that. And I was doing this Greek summer, um, French Alps winter rhythm. And it was working really well, but I was earning about 15 pounds a week in Greece. 
and then I'd work like a dog in a toffee, sticky toffee pudding factory and a snowboard shop and anywhere else at McDonald's, anywhere I could to get the money up for the winter. And after about four years of that routine, my knee, my first knee was starting to give out. I was having problems with that and I wanted to have a bit more money. And someone told me about the mega yachts in the south of France. So after a winter in Val d'Isere, I set off down to Antibes to look for work on the boats. And I did two summers down there working on this ungodly mega yacht, 57 metre long thing, owned by the guy who owned the Pyramid Marketing uh, plan company, Herbalife. And I earned a lot of money for back then. I think I was earning two and a half grand a month, but I had no rent, had no food costs. I lived on the boat. Um, and you'd get these, if you had American guests chartering the boat, you'd get these huge tips, like 1500 bucks. They'd, it was, uh, I think it's 150 to 200 grand a week to rent the boat. And 15% tip was written in for the crew. And we were a nine person crew, 10 if they wanted the helicopter and the engineer was on. One of my jobs was holding down all the towers on the jacuzzi while the helicopter landed on the aft deck. So the blades were at eye height while this helicopter's trying to land on a boat. It was insane. I've got, the stories I've got from that are mental. But long story short, I learned that money destroys people. I met two happy people. Uh, Mr. Biffa, the billionaire who runs all of Britain's waste collection, came on. He was happy. Oh, right. Yeah, right. Okay. That's what they're actually called, isn't it? Biffa, yeah. Yeah. So Mr. Biffa came on. He was happy. His boat had broken down. He rented ours last minute. Um, and he was rad. And a Texan oil baron family where the money had been in the family for ages. But the rest of them were deeply unhappy. They'd sacrificed friends and family in pursuit of these vast fortunes. So I learned about money. But I was working... You'd get, I'd get up at six and I'd work until the guests went to bed. And it was manual labor seven days a week to earn all of this money, ironically. And I used to get off that boat. And we're talking about not drinking, but I, it's the first time I've ever done it. I'd just go and spend a load of money on a hotel room and a lot of booze and whatever else and just get stuck into it for two or three days. And I realized that was the first time that I've ever kind of parted to escape and it was my knee was breaking up so my identity as kind of doing it all for the end goal of becoming a professional snowboarder was in jeopardy as well and that that period those two summers I really struggled and getting out of that and remove I then broke my knee and removed myself from snowboarding and started at white lines with a fresh perspective that I needed to do what made me happy, that I didn't want to chase money and that money was not going to help me achieve my dreams. And that was very, a very, very important realisation for me. Good one, Sophie, if that is your name. I think we've got some good, sir. Um, okay. I, this, this was the one that I reposted and everybody thought it was really funny, so I guess I will... <laughs> I will um, ask it. What percentage of Ski Sunday viewers fast forward all the skiing, ski racing, sorry? I don't know. I don't know, but it's it's funny, isn't it? This Most people who reach out and get in touch with me say that they don't watch the ski racing, but those well, then people... Most people on Twitter are always like, they've ruined it. It used yeah. to be ski racing. Yeah, I see that. It's it's half a one, half a dozen of one, six six the other, and I, I don't know. It's I think I appeal to the snowboard side of the audience, so that like those people are reaching out to me to tell me what they enjoy. So I've got a skewed perspective on it, but I I'm really really proud of the range of content and subjects that we cover on that show. Because if you want ski racing these days, like media is so pinpoint. If you want dedicated ski racing, go and watch Eurosport 
and like you'll get really you'll get every single run every replay like if you're that into ski racing you're not going to watch ski sunday it's kind of like if you're just super into football you're not just going to watch match of the day match of the day is for the casual fan if you're into it then you're watching Got sky sub yeah all and all of saturday's devoted to it it's just the same thing like we're and bbc bbc 2's directive is not viewing figures like bbc 1 is in is doing battle with the commercial stations but bbc 2's directive is to create content that niche content for and they're not after they are ski sunday is not measured on the number of people watch it and it it does actually have some decent numbers it's measured on i don't know why they call it ai but it means audience appreciation and it's a score out of 10 and ski sunday is one of the few shows uh that's measured on that scale on any channel that consistently scores above eight we like an 8.1 8.2 always and that's what they that's what the commissioners care about and it it consistently uh delivers for audiences and that on that front i'm really proud of it in that we've turned it into something that covers it shines a light on every area of winter sport i think nearly every area yeah i think i think you should be i think you know you're never going to yeah, you're never going to please everybody, are you? But it seems like really, really well rounded to me. Like you know, you've got you've got the you. I mean, the idea that you would have Jamie Anderson and Mia Brooks doing a thing on Ski Sunday like ten years ago even is would just be laughable, wouldn't it? But equally, you've still got like the the core ski stuff and yeah, and Shemi yeah, think... Shemi this year because we had time not traveling, she built some like stuff that I like just how a slalom course is laid. How much difference uh, the um, gliding makes, and like just little things like that. We're like, oh right, okay. And it actually brought the ski racing to life for me. I watched more of the ski race. Like confession, I don't watch a lot of the ski racing. I watch a bit of it, but I watch the big races. But I watched a lot of it this year, mainly because we had a Brit doing really well as well. All right, I'll let you off. Um, who was that one by? Sorry, reading Instagram is not like the most dynamic podcast content, is it? Sorry, everyone. Uh, ads on tour, that was. Um, okay, next one. AJ Kemp asks, does the free ride world tour need to learn anything from natural selection to stay current? There's a couple of questions on natural selection. So, um, and, and, you know, I'm sure you've got some views on that. So, yeah, what do you reckon? Um... No. First answer, gut answer. I haven't actually thought about that. I think that there were there were obviously some small learnings, which in technical terms, as someone who works in TV, like you're like, of course they've got to have drones now. Like they've got to chase drones down the hill. And they're doing that. And it the drones that they had at the first two free ride world tour events in Andorra show you just how good those cats were in uh Jackson. Like they were really struggling. And interestingly, uh, if you want to get really nerdy on this, the Free Ride World Tour pilots deserve a, a bit of credit. The hardest thing to do on a drone is to lose altitude because you can't power through that. You can't power the drone down. You've got to wait. That's one of the moves that gravity's got to work on. Every other direction you want to go, the drone can accelerate into it, but you can't accelerate the drone down really fast so descending really quickly is very difficult and you saw that in natural selection on that jackson face and that is about half the gradient maybe maybe even less than uh the free ride world tour faces so they're going to struggle to replicate that a very steep face is hard to track on um but in terms of the format i don't you can't go toe to toe you can't go head to head. I love that single run format, all or nothing of free ride world tour. To me, that's that's the essence of it. And I always, it's one of the things. If you want to compare and contrast that format question with something like uh, Red Bull Rampage, the big mountain free ride uh, mountain bike event, they have two runs there, and the second run's consistently a washout. It's always windy. 
Only half the field show up for them. It's such an anti-climax for me, that second run there. You look at all of the big ones and you only have one race in Formula One. You only have one descent at Kittsville. You only have one run in uh, uh, the Free Ride World Tour. And I love that pressure that the athletes got to deliver in that one minute, 30, two minute descent. So the entire season comes down to 10 minutes. I love that part of it. Um, the one thing I would like to see the free ride world tour do, and it's not a learning from natural selection would be change the venue more often. I think it's unfairly weighted to the more experienced skiers who've been skiing the same faces for four or five years now, Fieberbrunn, Kicking Horse, Hakuba, Verbier. I think Verbier deserves to stay at the end. There isn't another face like that in the world. And as the event has proved over the last 10 years, people are still finding lines on that. The level's going up and there's new lines being opened up. So, But I think the others, they're smaller faces, they're more limited. And you're starting to see, I, I watch a lot of it, but you, I start to see repetition in there. Yeah, I'm really... You know, I'm really looking forward to the next two legs of natural selection because they're going to be way more free ride orientated. You know, like Jackson was always going to be for the freestylers, really, and it was designed like that. So then, and the net, you know, the the Alaska leg is going to be pretty fascinating. So how, how does it, how does it work? How many people can get into Canada? Will we see the same athletes? And is Alaska? How many people go to Alaska? I actually don't know, which is slack, isn't it? Um, I think. Off the top of my head, I think Canada with the quarantine is tricky. I think they've. I think it's going to be quite a basically like a Canadian field, really, in Canada. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's all being announced this week, okay. which is. Um, I, I know, that, know that, numbers really. that numbers in Alaska are very limited, aren't they? And I yeah, it's super I, limited. Yeah, I felt for Marion Hayati, for example, and. Victor De La Rue, not so much. I thought Victor, like Victor's one of the free, and Nils Mennick, they're two of the free ride world tour athletes who can really mix it up there. But I thought Marion wasn't, like Marion is a very, very strong rider. And if you wanted to be mean, Marion sort of basically stood on her feet to make the final, which is arguably what you do on the free ride world tour like i look at the free ride world tour facing you know oh my god you could do that you could do that but rule number one in the free ride world tour is make the finish you've got to stay on your feet and a, a lot of people can level accusations at marion that she she wasn't high enough standard give her a run in alaska and come back and say the same thing she would she will wipe the floor with a lot of those women in alaska i think yeah but I just think as well, like the judging will work itself out. Yeah. It was the first one, you know, like a lot of, obviously there's, there was comments about the judging at natural selection. Let's just put it that way. And I did, I did give Travis the opportunity to kind of go there if he wanted to, I was never going to go like you fucked up the judging mate. Like, let's talk about that. Cause I don't think that they did. So, so like I gave, I did sort of give him an, you know, we, I was like, let's talk about the judging. Um, and my view is that it'll just get worked out. I, ju- I just think it's like everything. I, else. I, 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 I have uh, no qualms with the judging. I thought it was yeah, brilliant. And just, yeah, and I just, you know, obviously there was a couple of debates about like whether Mickle should have got through, and you know, you've just raised the Marion thing or whatever. But like Rasman, next year, like Pat Moore, I thought they... Rasman, yeah, like, but in a year, two years, when it's dialed. Riders will know what's expected, but, and also, but you almost don't want that. Like I, I think that you want that fluidity in the judging. You know, no, but like, I, yeah, that's that's what I mean. Like, I, 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 but I think on the level of like you're talking about with with Marion, you know, like almost saying she took a free ride world tour approach to that event. Like, stay on your feet, just get to the bottom, and that got her to the final. You know, like I think as as this gets a couple of years under its belt, like those those like approaches will. 
it'll become apparent like what's going to work in that event and what's not. And I think what will work will be the fluidity and the and the the kind of expression that is being looked for, isn't it? You know. Well, so. Interestingly, and I a couple of people came at me with the classic, well, the women were rubbish trope, like they couldn't stay on their feet, and I was so angry about it because for me, the industry has supported for thirty years backcountry freestyle parts for male team riders and women have had to fight tooth and nail to try and get those anywhere near a a tiny part of that filming budget so it's going to take a lot more time for them to be able to get comfortable in that environment and work through that like they haven't had the same investment and there hasn't been the same heritage so we're coming back to the diversity argument again but i for that reason they need more support than anyone else and i'm i think it, it will see exactly what we've seen in slope style over the last decade where the speed of progression in the women's become is going to be breakneck and it's going to be one of the it'll be the most exciting category arguably maybe not yeah but the fact that that judging for me the deli- i said it in my my instagram post about it the delicious conversations we started having again about the merits of each run were just yeah. it was incredible. It's it was lovely. Yeah, it was great. It was great. It was the biggest buzz in snowboarding for years, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, next one. What do you see as the vital ingredients to ensuring any action sport thrives? Hmm. What great question. It's a good one, that, isn't it? John Beasley, friend of the pod. I I think adversity is like, and I'm only looking historically here, but you need a, a degree of adversity which creates camaraderie and solidarity amongst the people doing it think one of the key ingredients in action sports is that they're hard and they hurt so if you're doing them there's kind of this unspoken bond between people that you have worked hard and the better you are the harder you've worked and the more you've got through so that that creates that and you you get that bond and that's where I think you, I mean, we call it action sports, but like you suffer for your art. And I think there's an element of art history there. It's creative. So you, it needs to, you need to have self-expression. You need to have adversity. And I'm not sure the third ingredient I would say, and I'm not sure whether this is, whether you need it or whether it's a product of the other two, I'd say maybe culture. Like, does the culture grow out of the creativity and the, the adversity, like the stories that you want to tell, be them musically? Like, on, I mean, that is a very, very interesting question. And I was just thinking, I was just trying to think of a few parallels. I was just, I was immediately trying to think of like examples where the culture hasn't followed almost to prove the point, if that makes sense. Well, I, it's really, I, the reason I say culture so early on is that, well, for me, the adversity was it's, it's appeal and, and it's hook like that hook that keeps you coming back because you, you can't do something. You desperately want it and it would just keep eating me. And I wanted to get back there. And it, but the the culture is having done so many Olympics and having been around the the sports that don't have that, like or what they've got is so woeful. Like even alpine skiing, which does have a culture. I mean, there's a big culture to it, but it is so dry. There's no art. There's very little art good art inspired by alpine skiing there's no music beyond kind of umpa bands it's like but you look at snowboarding skateboarding surfing like the music like i was reading going back to um curator and reading the boarding for breast cancer piece and just remembering those those events back in the 90s where like you had the beastie boys playing like 
I remember I remember the Chemical Brothers and the Prodigy coming up to Val Air because they both wanted to go snowboarding and playing a gig in Ladai. Utter madness. Like that's what mm. snowboarding brought to the mountains. It's you had that kind of culture and you look across the fence at the sports who don't have it and they're just there's nothing there. It's bereft. And so for me, that's got to be one what, of the key ingredients. Do they, do the other sports, are they jealous of it? Of that? Do they notice that? No, because it attracts a certain sort of person. Like if you're into snowboarding, then I mean, I, this is one of my great fears is that the culture is drying up. I I actually think this winter I've had my uh, confidence, my confidence has returned that maybe it isn't dying out. But for a long time, I feared that the Olympics was killing it, that we were getting people come into the sport whose sole goal was to win an Olympic medal. And that was their career path because the industry collapsed to such an extent that that was the only way to make a living out of it. But I feel like that tide has been turned slightly, but I know I think people, if you're into Alpine skiing, I don't think the only person I ever thought that with was um, Bodie Miller, the American downhill skier, heavy drinker, wild child. And he just didn't fit in Alpine skiing. And I thought you would love snowboarding. You would have been really good at this, but in the most part, the alpine skiers are—they just love that alpine routine. They—they they don't see what they're missing. Right. And you, yeah, you gravitate towards what appeals to you, don't you? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just I never really thought of it like that, though, especially in that Olympic environment. Because, yeah, I mean, Jesus, this year when skating and surfing's in it, it's going to be quite the standout, isn't it? So what? I just wondered if if there was a, like if any of the other sports in that environment when you suddenly see this like what are quite evidently like really vibrant cultures arrive if if there's any acknowledgement that that it's different really well the one that always um sits with me and lots of the photographer i'm sure i've talked about this on the pod before but lots of said this to me when we were discussing snowboarding and like the what the effect the olympics were having on it and he looked at me and he goes, well, you know, this has happened before, the Swiss photographer. And I said, like, no. When? He goes, hot dog skiing. It's like it was the raddest thing on the mountain in the 70s. Like hot dogging in the 70s is what snowboarding is in the 90s. He said, look at it now. 40, 50 years on and hot dog skiing is literally Chinese gymnasts who, could, who learned to ski secondarily to their gymnastic ability going off these perfectly preened kickers trying not to blow their acls as they do quadruple somersaults and they've capped them they're not allowed to do five somersaults (laughs) wow and there is zero culture there there's obvious there's a little bit but i i made a comment about it to anna thompson an online journalist for the bbc when lloyd wallace to my great shame and i said ski i was talking about ski big air inevitably going to be replacing the aerials and Lloyd Wallace a kid who's worked insanely hard gone through some horrific injuries to get to the Olympics and me basically telling him his sport was uh, on its way out was his reward for doing that that was about the extent of the coverage he got so um, I felt pretty bad about that but I didn't yeah that's that's sadly the way it is but the, yeah. and the weird thing is the Olympics are chasing down these sports that have culture at their very heart and then they strangle that out of them and move on to the next one it's it's a worrying trend yeah yeah sorry okay. I, bored, I bored you to do that. no not at all not at all i was more thinking like um you know what it's like Ed. you've got three things going on when you're doing these things you're looking at the time you try to look yeah. at your instagram account so that's just my uh, that's my poker face. Um, <laughs> Phil Young's put one on, which I'm not going to say. I'll maybe leave that for when when the uh, the, the the tape has stopped rolling. Suffice to say, it involves two pence pieces. Um, <laughs> oh God! Richie Spider asks, and this is a good one probably to end it on. I'm going to say, uh, what's his perfect Sunday? As soon as it is Sunday where you are. 
core. And you probably had a lot of time to think about this. Well, I've spent a lot of time practicing. Um, perfect Sunday. Depends what season it is. But I live in Wanaka, so if it was, there'd be a skate for sure. If it was winter, it'd be a split board. There's some epic terrain out there. Go up to Treble Cone, hike out the back and have a really nice split board. Come back down, maybe a bike ride or, I mean, for someone who grew up in the UK in council skate parks that are consistently put on the cheapest land which usually meant the roughest areas new zealand skate parks are it's like nirvana it's unbelievable they're literally lakefront or oceanfront and the the skate park in wanaka sits on the lakefront it's like being in montreux staring out over the mountains it's insanely beautiful so sitting down there with all of the crow having a nice skate Probably take away Mexican and then bike ride home. That'd be that'd be a good Sunday uh, with the family for me these days. Maybe a kicker session in there somewhere involving landing my first double backflip. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, Eddie, there we go. Oh. Episode 150A, third appearance. How was that? That was really, really good fun. Thanks for having me on again. It's like I'm I'm in awe of what you've created and the quality of every single pod. They're brilliant. They're absolutely, I'm still, despite being on it, I feel a bit Jim Davidson, but I love it. Absolutely love them. And then Davidson, how do you mean? (laughs) Get to be on them and then listen to them all. You know, what was it? Can I sing the theme tune? Yeah, well, I mean, you were first guest four years ago in the front of your car at Ispo. It's pretty funny. It feels like a while ago. It feels like a lifetime ago, Ed. And I, I remember thinking at the time, days. I'd, I'd, I'd listened to a couple of podcasts, but I was like, wow, this, this is pretty ambitious. Good luck, Matt. This, this should be fun to see. But, I mean, it's phenomenal. It's the body of work that you've created there. And the, I think what I've been most impressed with in the last year is how topical it's become. It's that's what I've really enjoyed is that they're not just people coming on and talking about their life stories, getting some really, really interesting subjects covered. So, Uh, you know me, I've always I've been trying to crowbar that shit into this for years. (laughs) Finally got an outlet where I can do what I want. Uh, It was really great, Ed. It's great to see you. Yeah. Oh, thanks for having me on again. It's been fantastic.